And now if you want to turn over to Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3. Today we're going to be looking at compassion for the lost, an opportunity to share the gospel. So um, I went away to Virginia to go to college in 1981. That's a long time ago. That's more than 40 years ago, I believe, if I do my math correctly. I'm sure some of the young people are saying I wasn't even born yet. That must have been the dark ages, whatever was happening back in that time frame. Um, but I went to Bible school, and uh, as all of us new students got there, uh, we signed up for our classes, and we were informed that there was a required class we had to take, which was called Evangelism 101. Um, Evangelism 101, as the name implies, we're going to be taught how to share the gospel with other individuals, so that sounded pretty good. But I will tell you, there was two things I did not like about that class. The first one was the time that it met. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 o'clock in the morning. I, did, I thought when you went to college, you slept until at least 10, right? That, what was that all about? Um, but 7 o'clock in the morning, off we went. The other thing that I didn't really care for, we had a couple labs we had to take. One of them was called televangelism. Now, the name televangelism, you might think about television evangelism. That's not what it was. It was telephone evangelism. And uh, this is back in the day when you didn't carry your phone in your pocket or in your purse. It was back when there was wires coming out of the wall to connect all the phones. And uh, we had to, I think, ten twice, maybe three times. I don't really remember because it was so long ago. Uh, but on Sunday nights, we would go to a classroom, and there'd be 40 or 50 students in the classroom. And the professor, who was, it was a bit odd, a bit eccentric, kind of rough around the edges, um, an older guy, um, might even use the word gruff maybe to describe him. And um, he would call people on the phone to witness to them. And the way he would do it, though, was he'd take out a phone book and just go through the phone book and call until someone picked up. And, and by the way, it was on speakerphone, so we were supposed to be there quietly listening to the conversation take place. Uh, once he got you on the phone, though, he was insistent. He was going to get through his presentation no matter what. Um, if you interrupted him, he would scold you. He was going to quote to you verses like, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, that there's coming a day that it's appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment, and you need to repent of sin. Um, and people sometimes would be somewhat irritated with him and combatant. So you can imagine a classroom of college freshmen, students listening to this. Sometimes we would chuckle, and then the person on the other line would say, is there somebody listening to this conversation? Um, but the only way you could get off the phone with them is if you hung up or if you accepted Jesus, whether you wanted to or not. I mean, those were really your options at that particular point. Um, but then if we were laughing or chuckling, once he got done with that call, then he would scold us. The, the biggest thing I learned about televangelism is I don't think it's the best way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ is on the phone with people you're just calling through the phone book. The other lab that we did uh, was to go out on Saturday mornings into the community. Um, we were to go out and knock on doors and share the gospel with people who opened the doors to us. So you can imagine hundreds of college students loading up in yellow school buses, going out to various neighborhoods, being dropped off on the corner. You've got two hours, knock on every door that you can, write down, take notes, who you met, the conversation, their response, all of that information. So um, fortunately, we went out in groups of two or three when we were dropped off, and with me where there was two young ladies, uh, freshmen as well, we got off the bus, I said, if it's okay with you, I'd like to do this a little differently. And they said, what do you got in mind? I said, rather than knocking on doors and quoting scripture to people and frustrating them, why don't we just go door to door, introduce ourselves, and offer to help people? And the two young ladies said, that sounds really good to me, let's do that. So off we went, we knocked on I don't know how many doors, and we finally knocked on a door and we met an older couple. Now when I say older, that's a relative term. <laughs> I am probably older now than they were when I first met them. Their names were Mr. and Mrs. Patton. We knocked on the door and we told them who we were, told them that we were here if they would like some help today. We were there for a couple hours. We'd be glad to help them. And they said, absolutely. They were over, overcome with joy and delight because they were going to work in the garden. So three college students, not yet 20. Well, that sounded pretty good to them. So off we went out back and we worked. They told us their story while we were out back that day. Uh, they had known each other when they were in school back in high school, but they went their separate ways, and they got back together when they were 50 years old, and they were married now for several years. And we, of course, they asked a, a more about us, and that gave us an opportunity then to share the gospel with them. So we did that. We got back on the school bus, went back to the school. Next time we went out for our lab, we went right back to that same house, the three of us, and we offered to help once again. I think that day they served us some food, so I think we did pretty well the second time out. <laughs> Once the requirements were done, it didn't stop us from going. 
we had developed a relationship with them. And for the rest of that semester, and actually for several years, we would go back over their house about once a month or sometimes twice a month and help them with whatever they wanted, housework, garden work, and they would feed us. And I think the two young ladies dropped out by the time I met the young lady that would become my wife, and then she and I continued that journey together. And that lasted for 20 years, that relationship. That relationship turned not only into a friendship, but into a family. They attended our wedding in Northern Virginia, drove several hours, and they allowed me to stay with them between times when I didn't have a place to live until we got our own apartment. It was so much more than evangelism, it was discipleship, it was fellowship, and it was family. When they moved away to Florida, we unfortunately had to mourn with her as he passed away, but she celebrated with us as the, as the Lord gave us children. When she moved back from Florida to Virginia, after we moved here to Illinois, whenever we would travel to Northern Virginia to see family, we would stop, go out of our way several hours to see Mrs. Patton until the day she died, I think in 2001, if I'm not mistaken. The biggest thing I learned from door-to-door -door evangelism is my preference is not phone evangelism. <laughs> it's really not door-to-door, -door, but it's relationship. Because it's more than just evangelism, then it's discipleship, it's fellowship, it's truly family, and we're so blessed for that. Today we are looking in our passage at evangelism, and I'm titling it Compassion for the Lost. We're going to see in our passage today that we need to be a people who go, but I would say as we go, we need to be ready to serve. And then once we see the Lord at work, we need to acknowledge that it is God who has done this work and not us. And then finally, it's important for us to present the gospel with boldness and clarity to those who don't know him. I'd like to ask you to stand for our context today. I want to begin reading in chapter 3, verse 1, and what we looked at last week <clears throat> to get us back into our passage. Ch Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. I'd like to ask Jean Marquez if you would pray at this time, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unconditional, continuous, and compassionate love, unmerited, unwarranted. Thank you for your keeping us and protecting us, and we ask that you open our minds and our ears and soften our hearts as you speak to us via Pastor Steve to be compassionate to the, all of those around us. In, this, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The first thing we notice in verse 1 is the need to go. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. When we think about evangelism, when we think about missions, when we think about the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples, we often think about going overseas. I don't want us to miss the simplicity of just going about our daily life, our daily routine. In this particular case, Peter and John, they weren't out looking for ministry opportunities. They were going to pray at the temple. You might also notice they went together. Any planned ministry it is wise to do as a team, not to go it alone. But while you're going, you need to be concerned for the needs of others, not just simply to present Jesus Christ, the gospel, directly, but what are their needs and how can you minister to them? The lame man was there asking for alms, and they had no money, but they offered something greater, didn't they? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, wouldn't it be sweet to be able to do that? Can I get an amen? Since we can't do that, let us recommend then being able to serve in other ways, to minister to them. I was overwhelmed this week. As I mentioned last week, the idea of blessing bags, several individuals said, I am willing to put them together, and we've got a whole team ready to go now. 
So with that being said, we're going to need donations. So we'll get a list out really soon about things that can go into these bags. And I would recommend that we make probably two different types of bags. One that's a full bag with a Bible and gospel track and all that. And then a follow-up bag when you see the same person a second time to give them something to drink and something to eat. So there'll be an opportunity to donate, but also then to pick up a bag or two each week to hand out. Now, I realize that this is not going to be um, an exacting ministry and I don't even know how effectual it's going to be from our perspective. It's not as simple as handing out a bag and then someone says, okay, now I'm ready to get help and find a job, or now I'm ready to trust in Jesus Christ. That's not how it's probably going to work. But I think if we do this, it might give us opportunities for further conversations. And we might need to keep track, too. We might, as a community, need to keep track of who we've handed these bags out to, lest someone have 10 of these bags on the same day, right? But wouldn't that stir up some conversations then? to find out we are the church is handing out these blessing bags, and who knows how the Lord might use that. In any event, if God does work, if someone does get saved, it will not be because of us. It will not be because of what we have done. We'll be part of the process, but it will be nothing less than the good grace of God, and we need to acknowledge the work of God. Look at verses 7 and following again, what's said here. They took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, as the lame man who, was, who held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. Verse 12, here it is. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though through our own power or godliness we made this man walk? That's pretty profound, isn't it? They were there, they were part of it, they were present, but ultimately what took place was not their work, it was the work of God. Now I point this out on occasion, but I want to point out again, it is not our power, it is not our godliness, it is not our goodness that brings these things about, it is the work of God. And, I, and again, I know when people say the phrase, I think they, in most cases, understand that they're going beyond this. But it is not the power of prayer. It is the power of God. And I would encourage us to be more precise in our language to recognize that it's not some intermediate thing, but ultimately God who is at work. You might also hear it in our world today that you just need to trust in your faith. What? That's like trusting in a table. You need know, to trust in God. We need to have the right object and recognize the right source of all things. We need, it is the power of God and we need to trust in God. And by the way, that's where this goes in verse 13. Notice how he says it. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. He is the source. He is the origin. And this, of course, led to a great opportunity to present the gospel. Now, on Easter morning, I, I, I noticed that in our early sermons and acts, they have several common elements. And I want you to look for these as we go through this sermon now in Acts chapter 3. You're going to first of all recognize that God is mentioned who foretold of the things which would take place. You'll notice that men were responsible. They delivered up Jesus. They denied Jesus. They crucified Jesus. The focus will ultimately be on Jesus who suffered and died. But praise the Lord, he rose from the dead. He is exalted on high. You'll notice that the apostles are mentioned as witnesses to these things. And then you'll also hear the gospel call to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. So look at now verses 13 and following as the gospel is presented there. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are all witnesses. And his name, look at this, through faith in his name, he has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets, that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And here's the call. Repent, therefore. And be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, 
whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Now again, these are early presentations. They are primarily to Jewish audiences. But you see the same thing when Paul, his first recorded sermon, is found in chapter 13. But then as you move on to the Gentiles, you'll notice there's a small shift, like at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. There's no mention there of the, of the prophets of old. There's no mention of the apostles. I would say, though, these five thoughts are a good way to organize your thoughts as you work on presenting the gospel to others. Let me see if I can suggest this to you. Maybe you might want to think about these things. Talk about God. Remind them that there is a creator who made all things. But this creator, before him, we all stand accountable. It is appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment, and it is God's judgment. Remind them that God is God and we are not. Then make sure you talk about sin and include yourself. All of us at one time were truth-suppressing God-haters in need of a Savior. Now, with that being said, as you talk about sin, don't simply dwell there, though. Move on to the focus, which is Christ Jesus, the solution. Point out that he is indeed the one who suffered and died, and he rose from the dead that we might be right with God. He has ascended on high. He is glorified, and he is coming again. And then also do remind people that we're talking about a historic religion here. We are talking about something that can be verified, eyewitnesses. That is a good thing to do. And then make sure you do present the gospel call that there is the need to repent of sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Not just to trust in him so your life is better, but to trust in him because you are a sinner in need of a savior. With that being said, I think these things are important for us to recognize that ultimately, again, it is the work of God. And as you have opportunity to share with them not only the gospel, also teach them about God's gracious salvation. We're going to get to it next week, but go down to verse 26 for just a moment and notice this. To you first, speaking to the Jews... God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. Now look at this. In turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That right there is a reminder that it is ultimately God's grace. Even our repentance, even our turning from sin is ultimately the work of God. Just as faith is a gift from God, so is repentance. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I want you to see this in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The same thought that ultimately this is the work of God. And we're going to get more into next week, God's grand plan, the return of Jesus, the restoration of all creation. But I don't want us to miss this important fact that the faith that we have came through him, according to verse 16, and it is God who turns us from our sin and iniquity. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 in order to verify this very point that we're making here. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, look at this, if perhaps God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Ultimately, you want to teach. If you are a Christian, it is not a work that you have done. It is a work that God has done for you and in you and through you. Now, with that being said, I want to draw our time to some concluding thoughts. And I have four of them listed in, in my page today. The first one is this. We should be a going people. Can I get an amen on that? The life of a Christian is not to be lived in isolation. It's not to be lived on your own. It's not to hunker down someplace in a basement in a bunker. It is to be a life of going. We're taught in scriptures we're to be in the world, but not of the world. Can I get an amen on that? Of course, that made me wonder, where is that taught? You hear it said on occasion, in the world, but not of the world. Where does that come from? Go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. It's actually part of Jesus' high priestly prayer for us. And these two thoughts are presented there in John chapter 17 as Jesus prayed for us while he was still here on earth. What a great intercessor he is on our behalf. John 17, verse 9. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. I come to you, Holy Father, keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. So he's praying for us while we are in the world. Now go down to verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. For they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As, I, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. So we're in the world, but we're not of the world, and yet we are to go into the world. We need to be a going people doing our daily routines, but looking for opportunities. We should be a, a caring people, meeting the needs of other individuals. So when I was younger, and some of you can relate to this, we used to have this conversation. If you had a million dollars, what would you do? That sounded pretty good, right? A million dollars, then you just live your life and have a great time. Now I think you have to have two or three million dollars to do the same thing, right? For those of you who are coming up behind us. But let's just make the argument that you have enough money that you no longer have to work. Or maybe you are retired. Now money is no longer a concern. You're just living life. You have the greatest commodity of all time, don't you? It's time itself. What will you do with your time? How will you spend it? Now, many people who are retired say, I don't know how I did everything before while I was still working. I've got so much to do now that I'm retired. But after it's all said and done, what should we do with our time? How should we use this commodity God has given to us? I, I would say, at the very least, there are two things we should do with our time. Number one, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. If you have extra time, seek the Lord. And number two, serve the Lord. And in doing so, you'll fulfill the great and second commandment. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and body, soul, and strength. And if you serve the Lord, you'll be serving your neighbor. You'll be loving him. If you have time, if you have opportunity, seek the Lord and to serve him with every opportunity that's given to you. Let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. A couple of verses there if you turn back. John 13, verse 31. John 13, 31. And so when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, we prayed this morning before the service, and someone was praying a reminder that the Lord has given us up an opportunity to be light in this world. And our light needs to shine forth that others might see Jesus in us. And that's part of the way how we present Jesus Christ. But in our care for other people, don't forget you also have to use words. There are some people that have come up with that phrase, right? Present Jesus and use words if necessary. After presenting him through our lives, we have to use our words in order to present the gospel. And that's a caring people who would present Jesus Christ. And that's the next part. We should be a gospel-sharing people. A friend of mine does this in a very simple way, and I think it's very effectual, and it might be something you want to do. Wherever he goes, he carries with him gospel tracts. And if we go out to eat, he'll take out that gospel tract. He'll put a little note on that with the tip and some contact information and leave it there for the individual who waited on us. And you know what? It's not rude. It's not offensive. You say, yeah, they probably all end up in the trash, all those tracks. They might, but what if one individual picks it up? I put a couple of tracks out in the foyer for you today if you want to pick them up. Don't take a stack. Take one or two, okay? But maybe if you're going out this week or you're around other individuals, take one and put on there a note. Just put our church's phone number on there if you want to, how to get a hold of us. When we think about individuals, and their eternal destination. We should rejoice for those who are going to heaven. Mm -hmm. But it should grip our heart when we think about those who will end up in the lake of fire for all eternity. One of the things I often think about when it comes time for a funeral is what a loved one would say to those who are left behind if they could speak. And I'm convinced that every one of them who knows the Lord, they would say, just so you know, there is indeed a, a God and I have seen him. And they would say, you know, I want to remind you again of my love, but make sure you trust in Jesus. But one of the things I've also been fascinated with is what would an individual who is separated from God for all eternity say? What would an individual who is awaiting to be cast into the lake of fire right now say to you here on earth? And for that, I don't have to speculate. It's actually in Scripture. Go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. 
And in this particular passage, we actually find out what someone who is awaiting the lake of fire is saying in Luke chapter 16. Look down at verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am, in, I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides all this, between us and you there is a great goal fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place for torment. An individual in that place wants some relief. And if that can't be meted out, they want someone to go and warn their family members, those that they love. We have an opportunity to do that. Now, that being said, I would also remind us, even in this passage, that if anything good comes of that as we share the gospel, it is nothing less than the grace of God. I want you to notice how the dialogue continues here, reminding us of the necessity of God's grace to open eyes and open ears and change hearts. Continuing on, look at verse 29. Abraham said to them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. The greatest testimony, of course, is Jesus Christ's resurrection. But even that, we cannot accept or understand apart from the grace of God. And yet, I will tell you, when you see it take place, you will acknowledge it is the work of God, that God has indeed changed that individual. And that leads us to the last thought, that we should be a humble people. If it all is dependent upon God, and yes, we are his hands and we are his feet and we are the ones who speak on his behalf, but ultimately it takes the work of God, we need to give all praise and glory and honor to God. We should be a humble people. If someone compliments you, if you've done something grand, it's okay to say thank you or to say welcome, but also say praise the Lord. It was ultimately what God did in and through me. There is nothing that we have that we did not first receive. And there is nothing good that we do that is based upon our strength or our godliness or our goodness. It is ultimately the work of God. I want to close out with reading from Psalm 105. If you want to turn there, you can. If you want to follow along, that's fine. If you want to just listen, you can do that. But here is a psalmist who is praising God with the recognition that ultimately David, it's in this case, he's not saying this is what I've done but rather a recognition of who the Lord is and what he has done. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask if you're able to stand for this reading now. If you want to sit and remain in your seat, you can. But if you're able to stand, Psalm 105, 145, Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. You can meditate upon the rest, but go down to verse 20 for now. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. 
My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Lord, may that be so. May we be a people who are pleased to be your servants, to be used by you in hopefully great and wonderful ways. But after it's all said and done, Lord, may we recognize that all praise and glory must go to you. For it is you who not only wills, but has the ability to perform your good will in and through us. So please, Lord, allow us to be a people as we go, to be compassionate for the, upon those who are needy, to always acknowledge that it is you who has done the great work, and then, again, with boldness, with humility, to proclaim the great gospel, that there is indeed victory in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.